Hi, I'm Steve Schindler. I'm Katie Wilson Milney. Welcome to the Art Law Podcast, a monthly podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The Art Law Podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Schindler Cohen and Hockman LLP, a premier litigation and art law boutique in New York City. Hi, Steve. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm just dying to talk about something other than NFTs. So we thought we'd revisit our our old favorite topic, um, equally confusing of fair use. Right, but this is going to be a slightly different twist on it. Yeah. So, so what are we doing today? So today we're going to talk about an analysis of the economic impact of certain copyright law developments in the U.S., particularly with respect to the uncertainty around appropriation arts legality and the parameters of fair use, which we've talked about in terms of the Warhol case and Kara U.B. Prince um, before on the podcast. This is a hotly contested issue, as we know. The line between the derivative work right protected by copyright and the copyright infringement exception of fair use that has allowed copying and appropriation in fine art under certain shifting circumstances is still in flux. So not only has the standard for when appropriation of existing expression is permitted in the fine art context changed over time, it's inconsistently applied within the same jurisdiction. So for example, in the Second Circuit, there's been some inconsistent law on this. And certainly between circuits, there's a disagreement and inconsistency, all leading to understandable confusion on the part of artists, the art market, and their lawyers who advise them on sort of where the rules lie here. But one thing we have not talked about on the podcast, we realize now after meeting our guests, is the clear concrete changes, both in terms of economics and market behavior, that such legal uncertainty might cause, which is a you know, very law and economics type analysis. So today we have two guests, economists Alexander Kuntz and Matthias Sali who will describe their analysis of the impact of uh, one particular blockbuster case on copyright fair use, Carrie U.V. Prince in 2013, and its impact on the art market, um, specifically in terms of what they call intermediary risk or indirect liability. And we'll, uh, we'll hear from them more about their research. Sure. So we're here uh, today talking with Alexander Kuntz and Matthias Sali about their recently published article in the Journal of Cultural Economics called Intermediary Liability and Trade in Follow-on Innovation, which appeared online uh, on February 12, 2023. Alexander Kuntz, who heads the Creative Economy section of the World Intellectual Property Organization, sometimes known as WIPO, uh, located in Geneva. Before joining WIPO, he worked as a senior consultant at the Federal Expert Commission for Research and Innovation in Berlin and as a research fellow at the European Commission in Seville. His research focuses on creativity, the role of intellectual property, and the impact of digitization on creative industries. Also joining us uh, is Matthias Sali, who is a full-time research fellow at, also at WIPO and a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. He earned his master's degree in economics from the University of Bern and previously worked as an economist at the Swiss Federal Institute of Intellectual Property. His research interests lie in the intersection of intellectual property and economics, and his current work focuses on the empirical analysis and impact of intellectual property rights in the creative economies. So welcome to the podcast, Alexander and Matthias. Yeah, welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Steve and Katie, for the kind introduction. So let's start with um, having you give us a summary of your research on this topic, and then you know we can dive into some of the details. Yeah, let me maybe start off with a disclaimer. As you mentioned, we work for the 
WIPO here in Geneva. So this is, of course, also political work and political environment. So let me put a disclaimer that we are independently doing this research and this is not an official position of our organization or of any of our member states, of course. Still, I think it may be interesting and let me kick off with the research itself. So we started off with a largely under-researched area, the visual arts market. And basically our, our starting point was, can we find out how appropriation artists would respond to the current legal framework? Would they care about copyright or not? And would that kind of affect their the ways they set up their artistic practice? We found out in the course of the research that this this would be difficult to actually get to. And we saw from at least anecdotal evidence that even more than scientists, artists wouldn't care that much naturally and would kind of, if it's their destination to appropriate art and make that their practice, they would continue probably to do so. What we then thought, start thinking about was actually, maybe it doesn't matter to the artist themselves that much, but maybe it does matter to a market that invests in them and that actually puts a lot of money on the table uh, to commission the work, to trade it, to curate it. And so we, we started to think about liability, which is again another topic that is that is largely under researched and that we would want to find out basically how liability would impact the behavior of trade intermediaries in the visual art market. And who are the intermediaries yeah. that you're talking about? And maybe we should also define what, how you define appropriation art. Yes, of course. Maybe I, I start with intermediaries. So what we looked at was actually a secondary intermediaries in the secondary market. So for example, galleries, auction houses, but we also had a eye on museums that would curate artworks uh, created by appropriation artists. So uh, that was the other angle. Um, maybe over to you, Matthias, if you want to explain a bit kind of the, the art historic background of this, if I may ask you. Yeah, maybe I think that we're in the middle of this study already. If we would talk about what we have considered as appropriation art, that's part of our data selection process as researchers that sometimes you have to do assumptions and you have to um, start from a certain point where you face limitations, but you like you go on with that. And we were relying for this study on artsy.net to um, obtain so-called genomes of artists. So for us, it was not really interesting, for example, to have a list of artists considered as appropriation artists or not with maybe 10 or 20 or so. We want to have a bit of a larger data set. And Artsy provided us, or we were querying their uh, programming interface with their genetic information that they collect on artists. And then they select over thousands of characteristics of artworks and artists as well. And we started this research with querying appropriation genetic information that art historians and also the AI and so gave to the artists and artworks. And that was our starting point to have a group of actually of artists that we would say could be affected of this liability issue that we are discussing in the study. Yeah, and maybe to back up, I mean, presumably before you were creating your data sets, which we're definitely interested in understanding, you identified a one event in terms of copyright liability that you wanted to measure the Kara UV Prince case in the Second Circuit, that case that dealt with fair use. You could tell us a little bit about why that case was sort of the the moment you chose to research around. And also, you know, when we're talking about appropriation art, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about artists like Richard Prince using the creative output of other artists in their own artwork in a very obvious way. I think we um, this was laying on three pillars, basically. So we were screening the law and economic literature as far as we can understand and screen for importance where we would see where schoolers are discussing these appropriation mm -hmm. art cases the most. 
And we were specifically interested in this, what we call contributory liability. So we wanted to have a case where intermediate was involved as well. And the second uh, higher court decision actually seemed to held liable as well, the Gagosian Gallery in that case. So that's why we chose it. And as well, we were comparing, for example, Google trend searches as well with other cases. And we wanted to understand whether the audience is reacting to such a case and not only like researchers as we or like legal scholars or so to have a bit of a bigger picture. And we were talking to market intermediates actually to people from, from galleries. So we were involved in a museum in Geneva here that held um, a Richard Prince exhibition, for example. And we wanted to find out like how important this decision actually was. And we thought that this uh, would have like probably the, the highest importance. I think you're raising an interesting like preliminary question that Steve and I think about a lot, which is you're right, the Carrie V. Prince case, which we'll give a little summary of in a minute, gained, you know, a lot of attention from legal scholars and lawyers and, you know, people who deal with licensing and copyright and the extent to which market participants care about that is not clear you know, it's never been that clear to us. We especially in the fine art world, I think it's our observation in practice that often market participants in the fine art world, maybe as opposed to performing arts, maybe don't react that much to legal changes because it's a pretty under contracted, you know, under lawyered space. So um, I don't know, Steve, right. what you think, I think about that? You know, it's interesting because when uh, the first Cariou versus Prince decision came out, I think in 2011. At the trial court at level. At the trial court level. And certainly among Art lawyers, this was a very important case and one that received a lot of attention. But if you recall on the district court level, Judge Batts ruled in favor of uh, Patrick Cariou and against both um, Richard Prince and the Gagosian Gallery and ordered that all of the outstanding appropriated works be delivered to Patrick Cariou, who was then empowered under this decision to destroy them. And that got a lot of attention, yeah. even in the art world, I think, in, as participants, because all of a sudden you had this judge saying, you've got this appropriation, uh, well-known appropriation yeah. artist, and we, you can destroy the works uh, because they violated your copyright, which is, of course, a remedy under the Copyright Act. And then, of course, the case was appealed to the Second Circuit. Uh, who came down mostly in favor of Richard Prince, as we know, in yeah, 2013. And, and so opened up, you know, a very permissive space for appropriation art. And we'll backtrack a little just to give some more background. So, you know, Patrick Carew is a photographer. He spent years, I believe, in Jamaica photographing, living among and photographing Rastafarians, um, and published a beautiful book uh, from his work there. And Richard Prince came upon this book at some point and blew up certain photographs in the book. Actually, I believe 30 or more photographs, um, right. in the, so a significant number from the book, and made some changes to them of various types. Um, the most um, visible in this case, if people have seen the photographs, is that he painted some blue blobs and Lozenges, lines. Lozenges, I think is the, the way the court decision <laughs> I'm not being them. very respectful. But yeah, there's some blue paint. On there's some, a guitar too. Yeah, a guitar, right. He painted a guitar in one of them. Um, so some of them were just a line of blue paint. Some of it was figurative, like a guitar. But the photographs were certainly not obscured. You could absolutely see almost the entire photographs. And so Patrick Carew sued in the Southern District of New York, sued Richard Prince and the Gagosian Gallery, and I, I think Larry Gagosian himself, who had displayed these works as part of a right. Richard Prince exhibition claiming copyright infringement of his photographs. I don't think there's any question that the photographs were are works of fine art, that they were creative, that they were protected under the Copyright Act. As Steve said, the trial court on summary judgment found that there was copyright infringement and that there was no fair use because Richard Prince's use of these photographs didn't comment on the, the work, wasn't parody, it didn't, it didn't reference the work in any way, it just used the work for something totally different, his own artistic practice. That got appealed to the Second Circuit and the Second Circuit said, oh no, no, that's not the right test for fair use we'll just tell you what we think 
part of the test should be, which is that the new works don't have to comment on the original work. They just have to have some kind of new expression, meaning, or message. As lawyers, we find this kind of decision very frustrating because what does that mean? Like, what's the distinction? How do we follow that? And how do we advise clients based on a standard like that? And um, as a kind of further confusion, the Second Circuit, I believe, decided as a matter of law that 25 of the works were fair use. Correct. So right. no need to do any fact-finding, right. just a matter right. of law, Which they're is, fair that use. Was, that was really extraordinary in a way, because for a circuit court to to sort of overrule the trial court on yeah. a factual matter, I think they just did not uh, care for the district court's decision. Yeah. But then they did send, I think, 10 of the works back. Five or 10, I don't remember. To be, five, to yeah. be reviewed again by the district court and left open the possibility, if they were infringing, that there could be liability both for Prince and for uh, and the Gagosian. Gagosian Gallery yeah. and Larry Gagosian. To your point. So it yeah. left open that possibility. The case then was resolved without further decision. But yeah, it, it was um, unclear. And I think it's worth looking up some of these artworks because the 25 that were as a matter of law fair use versus the five that weren't, you know, to a lay observer, it's not entirely clear what legal distinction the court was drawing. So, I mean, Back to you, Mateus and Alexander, but just to sort of tee up your paper, which is all about the confusion that this decision created, even though the higher court decision, as you said, found in favor of the appropriation artist, it also created a standard that was nearly impossible to apply precisely. And so for people in the art market who paid any attention, you know, they didn't know. Right. And just to add one more point before we turn it back over to you, is that the Second Circuit was kind of became an outlier in a way in the sort of permissive use of fair use because a, a year later there was a case out of our Seventh Circuit mm -hmm. by a, a well-known judge, uh, circuit judge, Judge Easterbrook, which basically took issue with the entire approach that the Second Circuit was taking and said transformative is not a test that exists under the copyright law. Yeah. Uh, and that is something that's entirely been made up. And the most important thing to look at is the four-factor fair use test, which is... Which is in the Copyright which Act. Which is in the Copyright Act, and it basically says, did this work usurp the market for the other work? Did it impose itself on the value of the work, as opposed to this kind of vague, you know, transformativeness test? And so by the time, as you were looking at uh, the data, you know, we have the Second Circuit going in one direction, which is, is a very vague, hard to apply standard. Mm -hmm. And then we have even the Seventh Circuit uh, saying that's not even the standard. Right. You've totally just departed from the Copyright Act and created a standard that isn't grounded in right. how we understand right. copyright law to be. Yeah, that's, that's the situation shortly after after Prince, and um, there have been some further developments which we can talk about later, but sure. let's turn back to your study. So, you know, clearly you did some research into that state of legal affairs and noticed scholars and commentators, you know, remarking that this created some uncertainty in the market, even though it was favorable in this case to an appropriation artist. So how did you go about measuring the impact of this court decision. Your discussion of, of factors is really uh, highlights our starting point at the end yeah. of the day in the sense that it it puts spotlight on the question of uncertainty, which for us as economists in market is a major thing. The idea that things are unclear and difficult to manage from you as a practitioner's perspective, but maybe as well for, for other trade intermediaries. This is really, really a moment in time where basically the there's potential that people in the market will respond to that. So if the legal framework or the way the legal framework is shifting is introducing uncertainty, that can actually trickle down to to the people that are operating on the market. That's basically the, the generic background. Let me maybe even go one step further back and give another argument why we think a contributory liability is important. Mm -hmm. uh, it is because 
in many of the discussions we're in and most of the research we're doing, or most of the research that this has been done so far, is actually informing discussions on how revenues are shared between stakeholders, which comes natural, right? It's kind of the moment when when new things are created and people talk about how who has contributed and who should be entitled to to certain revenues. Why we think liability is important or what this misses out on is basically a dynamic perspective, as we would call it as economists, where we're interested how the legal framework plays out over time. And this brings in this important perspective, which crystallizes in a sense around appropriation artists, how well does the legal framework balance the interest between current artists and future artists, and how well can the two uh, exchange, right, and operate together. So, and that's kind of an area that is, I think, very much understudied and and very important. If you are interested as a government and policymaker to set up a system that is that is over time helping the flourishing of creativity and business, of course. Yeah, I mean, in in many ways, the concept of licensing tries to solve that, right? This relationship between one creative person to another, where they can voluntarily loan or give limited rights to use of their material. And that's, you know, in many industries, like music, publishing, very routinized. You know, in the fine art world, we don't have, we don't see a robust licensing exchange between creative parties. We see it in brand partnerships and the monetization of of artworks, but between artists using each other's work, you know, there's no culture of that. So that that maybe is a particularly underdeveloped area of study because it's an underdeveloped, there's no mechanism in place um, to negotiate right. those factors. And I think as a practical matter, when, when we talk about appropriation art, where one artist is sort of taking apart or recontextualizing whatever you want to call it, The work of another artist, artists are not often very receptive to having their their photographs doctored up or picked apart and kind of put together in a different way. That's not something that they would... So they might not license it. I think we we see that. I mean, even in the first, you know, the sea change here was in the Campbell versus Acufro's case in the 1980s with the parody of Two Life Crew of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman yeah, the song. Music and they tried to get a license. Two Life Crew actually approached Orbison's um, copyright holders and said, can we have a license? And of course they said, no, because you're going to make fun of my song. <laughs> you're going to make, make fun, fun of my, of my song, song, so we're not going to license it. So I think that's the same thing with a lot of these appropriation artists, is that the, the original artist is not, Patrick Carey is not going to want to have his works um, painted over and things like that. So it's not really practical to think that that's going to happen. Yeah, right. The incentives are not there and the culture isn't there. So, okay, so you you are interested in this sort of economic market reaction to these kind of shifts in, in the law that create uncertainty around what standard will be applied. How then specifically are you measuring that? I mean, what do you do to test that? that premise and see what the result is. You can get into the weeds here. Yeah, so I've I've mentioned already that we were exploiting this rich data set from Artsy that were categorizing artists in not only obvious uh, distinctions like modern art or pop art, for example, but with this genetic information. And I could give you like an overview of tags that we were using, but basically all of them were nested information of um, around this appropriation genetic information. Sorry, could I maybe just ask a quick question because we, you keep referring to this genetic information. That's going to be misconstrued. (laughs) Sure, it's going to be understood by everybody. What because we're obviously <laughs> we're, we're not talking about actual genetics, so maybe you could just describe a little bit more what you're meaning when you say you're looking at genetic information of artists or artworks. So the starting point was for us the genome database, which started off as a project by art historians that tried to look at systematically categorize artworks and artists and they basically to give you an example they basically looked at an artwork by picasso and they said like this is this is blue and this is this is uh painted on on wood so they started 
to to roll out those tags and they i think they ended up with at least 1000 different type of text in order to classify and distinguish the work and basically that project was taken up by artsy as a service because they had in mind to develop something like if you go on amazon you get uh, recommendations this is what other people bought or this is what you might like and such algorithms are as actually building on tech data that makes different products comparable and, and makes them... Some marketing you an, Yeah. <laughs> so they try to do this for, for the visual art market and for, for our works at the end of the day. So they took over and they further developed basically this tagging classification. And that's very data heavy and very rich. And we basically took all that knowledge they developed around artists and artwork to to define what appropriation artists are that's important for research design to come up with a group of similar artists that would just differ in the appropriation genome as they call it in, in just one tag otherwise we try to set up uh, a group of similar artists that that was otherwise very similar matthias am i am i getting it right or should, would you like to yeah. add something? Absolutely correct. It's maybe easier to call them tags. Um, yes, and yeah. the treatment group, so the appropriation artists that we wanted to identify, they, like Richard Prince had 100 tags that we identified, and some of them were appropriation or appropriation close tag information. And our control group of artists basically had the very same tags as Richard Prince, but excluding the appropriation close tax. So that's how we constructed a control group of artists that we identified. And um, also the artsy service itself, they, based on the algorithms, they, it's also part of a business model. I always assume that they promote, like, if, if you like this, then you'll probably also like this artwork, for example. So we can rely on their algorithms as well there. Just, I guess, to be, I may, this is probably somewhat of a limitation. You weren't identifying appropriation art. You were looking at the market for artists and their whole body of work, which presumably you identified artists that mostly make appro what we call appropriation art or copying other people's work as part of their work. But um, you weren't actually identifying which artworks were appropriation, right? That was our initial hope, actually, that we get very fine-grained data on the level of the artwork that would give us the original underlying photograph, let's say, and then we could even ref look at, you know, the, the original artists, right, and how they would fare. But at the end of the day, we were only able to, to say, this is on the level of the artist. Um, this is likely somebody who is deeply into appropriation art versus this is somebody who, is, who does very similar things, who loves to paint blue paintings and work with wood, but is just different in that aspect of, of appropriation practice. Ideally, you would have a situation where you have, where you can randomly assign appropriation practice to artists. So you would say you have you have artists that haven't done anything. <laughs> and basically you would say like, you go, please, you go forward and practice appropriation art. So look for for works that you would like to transform and, and those things. And everyone else, starting from scratch artists, um, everyone else would just not be appropriating other people's uh, art. But that's not how reality looks like, right? Um, you have so, to look backwards. You can't look. Ex exactly. You can't we, need to look, yeah. we need to look back and we need to basically, well, identify a group of appropriation artists. Yes. But then we would also need other people who are very similar in multiple dimensions. So they, they're as successful in the market, let's say. They produce in, in similar decades. So we look for everything that is observable to us to make it very comparable to that other group. And that's what we call natural experiment in a sense. And that's one of the last times I'll use terminology, but difference in difference design is actually what we chose to do. And, yeah, and what does that such mean? A yeah, that's that's basically a comparison of market outcomes for the appropriation artist group versus market outcomes 
for this sim- group of similar artists that we identified as mm. well. And what it typically does, uh, it goes back in time, as you said, and basically looks at, for example, how well did artists in a similar group sell uh, before the court decision and how well did appropriation artists sell before the, that decision. And then it basically tracks how sales change once the decision comes in. And in that sense, we say like the appropriation artist group is impacted, is treated, as we call it, once the decision comes in versus the group of similar artists shouldn't care or shouldn't really care about the decision. So the goal, Um, I guess, is, as with any control group, is you're trying to create a group as close as possible to the appropriation data set, except the only difference being, which is impossible, but it's close enough, the the main only difference being that they don't create appropriation art. But in other ways, I guess I'm just guessing, but age, sex, uh, style, medium, that they're comparable sets. Is that right? Exactly. So everything that is literally observable to us based on the data sources we had. So we, we used auction data that has a certain set of information attached, right? You know, where, where typically the artist sells and which auction houses, you would know the size of the artwork. You would know, as you said, characteristics, uh, sociodemographics of the artists. And we basically compile all of that. And that's a major assumption, actually, in the difference and difference design that before the court decision comes in, both groups are literally performing the same. That's a major assumption. And we Mm -hmm. basically statistically test that to see that, yes, they are really comparable. So any change we might observe after the court decision is maybe driven by the court decision. It tries to causally link the decision to changes in the treatment group. Did I get it right, Matthias, or am I simplifying too much? Yeah, Uh, one specific point is maybe important. If you say Mm -hmm. that they have to perform the same, it is worth noting that the assumption requires only a common pre-trend, I will you say. So the trends Mm -hmm. have to be the same so that whatever trend happens after our treatment that we defined is then the average change for the treatment and um, before you had the same trend so we can rule out the possibilities that noise comes in from pre-treatment periods basically the the markets for the control group and the test group the markets were aligned pre-2013 is what you're saying and you can control yeah or Specifically, the the outcomes that we look at, we generally can frame it as the the market, but we are looking at specific outcomes, um, at outcome variables. That is, in our case, for example, the price of the artwork. That is the number of artworks artists had or the probability that an artwork results in sales success. So in those kind of outcomes, it has to have the same trends. So that's um, more trends. More data-driven. And and we kind of impose the term market on it as as lay people or, you know, participants in the market. So then can we ask, what were your findings ultimately? Well, um, the main finding we have is basically that the number of, of auctions among appropriation artists sees a slight drop after the decision uh, compared to our baseline, which is the similar artist group. So yes, they continue to have auctions, but there's a different trend, a different average number happening for, for the similar artists. That's our first main result. But as Matthias mentioned, there's a number of other outcome variables. For example, well, that's an indication that maybe those potentially infringing artworks, auction houses maybe were less willing to actually carry that litigation risk, right? Meaning they're, they were not as willing to sell through certain appropriation art. So finding one is there are just fewer pieces up for auction after the exactly. decision. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But you have some other findings about actually performance, <laughs> sales performance and performance at auction mm-hmm. too, which are interesting. So basically, if you make it to the auction, you see a decline in the probability that the work will actually sell off. 
And so you have that kind of the overall drop in the number of auctions, but once you're in, you're still less likely to sell, actually. And what about if you do sell? Was there a price shift that you investigated or was meaningful? I think we looked at the prices as well, but there was no significant effect, if I recall that correctly. Matthias, did you, can you confirm yep. or <laughs> disagree? <Yeah. laughs> okay. No, no, no. The, the answer there is that price formation, so we look in much detail at the price formation of those artworks. So again, our model does control, for example, for the size of the artwork or the time when the, the sale took place, for example, the year or the auction house, most importantly. But we were like able to replicate all those studies on basic auction house theories and sales. Um, but what we didn't find was actually a reaction of the sales price after the decision that we defined as our treatment period. Um, there are a number of explanations why this is the case, mostly probably because price formation is something that's a bit more stable. And since we were able to observe less auctions after the court decision, it could be that the one with the stable prices was like kept in the market while others were already taken out. So this is a limitation of the study that we cannot identify the same artwork over the time. We can only see the performances of artists over time. Well, and it's interesting, that sort of fits in with the, the more narrow scope of your study, which is not about the performance or the market receptivity to appropriation art in general, but that intermediary behaviors, meaning not the creators, but the, the sellers, the displayers of this work, you know, that, that was obviously the question in your study. And so the sale price wouldn't be as pertinent to that analysis, right? Because the intermediary decisions are, do I put this up for auction? Exactly. I think it's any measurement of a price effect would be more blurred also by a decision of buyers, right? And kind of right. in art investors. So I think this this is what we try to be, as you say, like we, we try to be narrow around the supply question a bit. What is supply to the market? What is curated to the market even? And buyers would be less concerned with fair use because presumably they're going to hang it in their home or put it in storage, and that does not raise copyright infringement concerns the way putting it in an auction catalog or displaying it in a showroom would. That makes sense to me. I want to ask how, so you design this study, you, you pick, based on the artsy data set available to you, you pick and categorize different appropriation artists. But it strikes me that a certain few very famous appropriation artists, like Richard Prince, Warhol, Liechtenstein, I don't know, I mean, you have a list, might skew the data set in a way that like maybe the market only for them changed or the market for them didn't change at all, but for the vast majority of artists who aren't that famous, whose work does not sell for that much, that the market does not pay that much attention to, there really wasn't a shift. So I don't know if that's something you parsed, um, but we'd be curious to hear if there were outliers that skewed the results. This is an excellent question, and, and absolutely yes. So this is the, the short answer. There, like Andy Warhol is definitely, or Picasso is definitely, in almost all auction data sets, like very much of an outlier. And this is something that our econometric models can address at first stage. So we basically run regression, so like calculate the effect based on the average treatment of an artist, and we compare then the averages across the artists uh, to be a bit more outlier robust in a next step this is then what we call robustness check of our models we can exclude specific artists we can only run the calculations based on the superstars we can interact what you call our treatment with the superstars only for example in order to find out the specific impact of them so this is something that the econometrics or the the statistics for economists can address pretty well, I would say. And what did you find when you did that? Um, well, one of the interesting findings is actually that we find so-called heterogeneity in the treatment. That means that, for example, that we run the calculations based on the pictures generation only, but we identified as core appropriating artists, for example. And interestingly, we found in this study that artists from the pictures generation, the pictures generation is from artist historians, a defined group of artists 
I think it was based on a exhibition in the 80s. Um, but I mean, you isolate them. Why do you is- you isolate them? Because they might be more high profile or more famous or why isolate them? No, I think they have a higher liability risk attached to them. In a sense, they're the iconic practitioners of appropriation art. So for us, it was basically a test to see the hypothesis we, we ran was actually there the effects must be most pronounced in that group because mm-hmm. it is crystal clear, basically, even for most outsiders, this is the core of the practice, right? So the test was to see if we can confirm the effects are most pronounced in that group. And we can confirm, right, Matthias? We can confirm, yes. Right. So I'm curious, and maybe I, I think I'm understanding what you're saying, but I mean, if you look at, for example, just anecdotally, not a data-driven mm-hmm. uh, analysis, but about a, a year after the Cariou versus Prince decision came down, there was a another lawsuit against Prince by uh, Donald Graham, a photographer, right, who had posted a photo on Instagram. And this was the project where Richard Prince basically downloaded, uh, commented on other people's Instagram posts, blew them up, and then sold them at at an exhibition at the Gagosian Gallery for $90,000-ish a piece. And this was post Cariou versus Prince. So certainly from one intermediary, Larry Gagosian and his gallery, they were not at all um, inhibited well, they felt like they'd gotten permission from the Prince decision. Yeah, yeah. so they were prepared to, to go ahead and have a whole exhibition. And I'm just wondering, are is this one of the kind of outliers that you were trying to eliminate? Yeah, maybe one step back, if I may. It's kind of, I constantly run into those issues when discussing the research, this economic research with <laughs> lawyers, because I understand your practice is wholly based on assessing case by case and being very concise there. The whole statistical approach that we run in in the research is really trying to tease out average effects, right, Matthias? So it's it's kind of across the board. You may still have that assessment that we have a change in the number of auctions includes the possibility that for an individual artist in that group, it is actually increasing after the court decision, right? But the majority of those people will see a slight drop in the number of auctions so it's it's similar like that just to explain that a bit so excellent point steve on the gagosian gallery i fully agree this is anecdotal evidence that they actually didn't care however as economists we're basically interested in those average effects and probably not everyone is has that those deep financial pockets as the gagosian gallery and the our point is basically that the average effect may actually have let the average auction house or average intermediary to to step down and, and sell less artworks by appropriation artists. So that's basically uh, part of our analysis. And one of your other findings was that there was a relocation of auction activity for appropriation art. So I, maybe we didn't make this clear, but your research is about the effect of this U.S., really one circuit in the U.S. decision on the U.S. art market, specifically intermediary activity with respect to appropriation art, which you assume is related to litigation risk. But you do something interesting, which is you you look at whether there are changes in other jurisdictions, and you haven't talked about that yet. So maybe you can summarize that finding as well. Mm-hmm. So I was referring to those kind of outcomes variable that we were looking at. And one of it was the relative percentage of auctions that were in the U.S. compared to outside of U.S. on the artist level. And we actually found that at least temporarily, a pretty significant decrease after 2013 of U.S. auctions compared to non-U.S. auctions uh, on average per artist. And this somehow makes sense because the decision took place in the U.S. and it could be the finding that you basically outsource the risk in other jurisdictions. But since we are confronted here with um, 100 countries, maybe, it's very complicated to look at all of the jurisdictions, of course, and to find out where the the trade probably relocates. But we we're looking at what's that um, shift outside the U.S., at least temporarily. Exactly. 
And you found a statistically significant movement of appropriation sales by intermediaries to outside of the U.S. Yeah, uh, so a decrease in auctions in the United States or a shift outside because we were looking at relative numbers. Yeah. It seems that some of the the artworks by appropriation artists, they went from, let's say, New York houses to London auction houses. Some of them are operating in many jurisdictions. So imagine it may be fairly easy to to actually relocate the sales to another place that is that has a more favorable jurisdiction set up. I think to your analysis, it's just where are the rules clearer? And you touch on this in your paper. None of us are foreign law experts, but we are all under the impression that the U.S. system for exceptions to infringement, especially in the fair use appropriation context, are much less specific and defined than they are in the exceptions to copyright infringement that exist in, let's say, the UK and, and Europe, where there absolutely are exceptions to infringement, for example, in the UK, parody and commentary, which we have here, which are about free speech concerns, but they're not as amorphous, I guess, in their, their legal application or judicial interpretation, and right. that that may create a market effect. Right, and, and obviously when we talk about auctions, in the United States, we're really talking about auctions in New York City, um, and yeah. auctions in New York City of are, expensive art of expensive art in New York City, uh, whether it be at Sotheby's or Christie's or Phillips, and um, those are all covered by within the jurisdiction of the Second Circuit, which is the the decision yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah, so that makes sense that the Second Circuit would have kind of nationwide impact on these major sales because they occur, uh, they occur in New York. I was interested in your paper that you you also found no impact in a couple of areas you studied. One you already mentioned, which was artist production, that there didn't appear to be artist sensitivity to this particular court case. And maybe we can extrapolate to say, you know, litigation risk in general. I, that would ring true to me just based on my observation of how much or little, you know, certain artists are are concerned with um, precise legal rules around how they can create their art. So that was interesting. And also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you found that in terms of sort of museum-type intermediaries, who are not selling, but they're just exhibiting work, that there was no statistically significant change in the exhibition of appropriation art, so access by the public to seeing this work. Is that right? Um, it's only partly. We had the idea that it's an incomplete picture to only look at auctions. Of course, it would be great to also look at like the, the primary market, galleries, for example, or museums. And we've done an initial and very preliminary analysis on, on one museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, to um, see whether the appropriation artists we identified had also changes in exhibitions in this specific museum for example we have we had a look at a couple of museum data that we were able to find but in the end we, we didn't found an effect there but this would definitely be um, a part of for a, like a, a follow-up study for example to look in greater detail actually because if I may mention that case in in France I think it started in 2015 and now, got confirmed by um, an artwork by Jeff Koons is no longer able, the Pompidou was not longer able to exhibit this piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be the case that also their copyright infringement and liability risk actually really are taking artworks out of a museum. So this is definitely, it is anecdotal evidence here. So I, w I would assume you would see reactions as well in the museum, in the museum world, but um, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, that's obviously the moving in the complete opposite direction that the Second Circuit moved in, the decision you analyzed. Yeah, let me maybe clarify uh, further on the issue of production of artists. So this is also rather anecdotal evidence and, and research done by other people when it comes to the potential changes in creative artistic practice, right? This comes out of survey evidence and other places. So we haven't inspected really. We didn't, we weren't able to track the production and the supply 
all the supply and the new oeuvre that artists would create. And if that would respond, that would be lovely to study actually as well. But we couldn't cover that in, in this in this study. Could I ask a question, um, just going back to the sort of shifting of, of more auctions of works by appropriation artists to auction houses outside of the U.S., were you able to or sort of consider or control for other factors? So, for example, I mean, uh, whether more works in general uh, were auctioned, say, in London versus the U.S. in a particular period of time, or whether other factors, currency fluctuations and the like, could be, could be a cause of, of the effect that you've observed. Or like a major retrospective in London that co- coincided with the sales. Or just, right. Yeah. Both both excellent points, I think, um, but we didn't look specifically into exchange rates, turbulences, or, or something like that, that may arguably could cause that. The general point that Matthias raised before, that we couldn't systematically cover all foreign jurisdictions to see if they, in this period, somehow changed massively. But I think we're comparing uh, the U.S. to global and I think then it makes maybe a still a useful benchmark. We also did other tests where we basically said like, let's not compare uh, similar artists to to appropriation artists. Let's just look at the appropriation artist and their global auction sales. Limit that down, and we basically then compared how this shift. This actually also showed this shift basically from from the U.S. to auction houses and other places. And maybe if I may add one more point, in general, I think I would fully agree that the U.S. with its fair use system uh, may actually have been conducive for something like the appropriation artists uh, movement to emerge in the very beginning. But that would probably be a different study, right? That's something we couldn't address. But I think it's an excellent, interesting point that in principle, that's our reading of the legal scholar literature, fair use is something conducive to this type of experimenting practice. Still, the main point then that comes out of our results is that a fair use um, setup vis-a-vis a setup that is based on a list of exemptions, for example, is still not a perfect alternative in a sense it has it its imperfections it seems that sometimes those flexibilities are actually increasing the uncertainty inside the market and that may actually change the behavior of the people that operate in that market yeah i mean it's that's i agree that would be a fascinating kind of legal history comparative legal history that i would i would love to read um i guess just on this sort of what other factors might be at play i was thinking reading your paper again that, you know, are there other reasons for a decrease in appropriation art activity, at least at auction, in the U.S. that might be related to these pieces being appropriation pieces, but aren't necessarily related to legal uncertainty or fear of liability related to the Prince decision? For example, like, Tastes in artwork change over time, right? The market excitement about contemporary appropriation art, we wouldn't expect it to be static forever, right? We would expect some some real in- interest, just like interest in sort of contemporary figurative art right now or portraiture, and then a decline. And I mean, it just, I wondered if there was just sort of a change in market interest or taste or, you know, curation around appropriation art in this time in general that caused that decrease in interest. And it wasn't because of the litigation risk associated with this decision. It might even have been because of this decision in terms of people's taste changing or finding it distasteful or, you know, having a moral reaction to sort of how fair use was being expanded but it wasn't about the litigation risk. It was sort of a taste change. And I, I don't know if you can control for that, but it just struck me that, you know, that is a plausible reason for the results you found that is not a litigation risk concern. Excellent point. And the short answer is no, we, we cannot rule out all those possibilities that you've mentioned. We can do probably do two things that I'm thinking about. The first is that 
like looking at the museum exhibitions, for example, it's an indication of that actually the people were still interested in appropriation art. Mm -hmm. And you can do Google Analytics, for example, trend search, whatever, that those kind of tools help you to understand whether people change taste. And secondly, I was thinking about the fact that we can also smaller the time frames of our analysis. So we did various robustness check of only including some periods before and some periods afterwards. And then you can like make sure that at least not too many things change at the same time in your observation period. But your general point that actually the decision itself changed um, something else, but that is not the litigation risk is in the end something we cannot rule out. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it strikes me that's something you could investigate. You're right that museum shows would be one indication of what current taste is, but maybe there, you know, there are other indices too that would inform whether tastes are changing for for different reasons. Yeah, maybe another counter argument is a bit that if you think, for example, of Kariu and others showing up in those court cases, you could think this is kind of a media coverage fact as well. Like they're more prominent in the press now, they're more frequently discussed. But wouldn't you think that this effect would maybe operate in the in the other direction, that they're actually growing more popular and that eventually should make uh, auction house directors schedule more more auctions? Maybe. It may be that there was some market saturation unrelated to this decision. I, I don't know. But some people, this is totally anecdotally, some people, certainly photographers, right, fine art photographers, some artists, certainly some lawyers, did not find this court case and all the attention around it, did not make them more interested in Richard Prince's work, right? It made them feel ambivalent or sort of negative about that type of work. So... I just don't know, but we observed a variety of reactions. Right. Um, it's very hard to, to map those onto sort of market changes, yeah. of course, because uh, trying to map the art market is, is, is not something that certainly we, I can We do. have not been able to do it. <laughs> it constantly not, surprises us. Right, right. So maybe we should end um, by asking you both where your research is going next, what you're interested in and uh, working on. In particular, Matthias has been very doing very beautiful research in two directions, and we continue to work on the visual art market. And one of them is is actually museums. And what we're interested in is the impact of digitization on museums and on how easy it is in times of digital change to actually exhibit and make available artworks online. And that's that's another direction we're, we're chasing after, and I think uh, hopefully that will be something that is that is of use for policymakers, and eventually, hopefully, uh, will improve their decision making. Another study that we are currently working on is actually the impact of the death of an artist on the exhibition patterns and the auction results an artist have. Mm. So, um, current research on death impacts focuses almost only on auction data. And what we do is that we combine auction and exhibition patterns together and try to understand the interdependencies of those markets, how maybe exhibitions could potentially impact price formations or the other way around. And we take the event of the death as a starting point. And this is as well interesting because Copyrights are granted post-mortem and like most of the studies look at what happens when the copyright expires and works move to public domain. But what is a bit understanding is the effect of what actually changes when someone dies because those rights are granted post-mortem. And in or they continue that, they continue post-mortem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're not going um, to in economics, we call that uh, transaction costs that might can occur after someone dies because you know, the rights shift and like other things might happen. And we want to understand that a bit better in a, in a future mm -hmm. study. Well, when you when you finish that study, let us know, because we'd love to. We'll do this again. We'd yeah. love to talk about it with you. This was really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's, it's very interesting to compare our anecdotal observations in our practice to um, 
to your economic analysis, which these studies will, we also have plenty to talk about. Right. And we'll, we'll post the article with the show notes and, uh, yeah. Oh, thank we'll you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great pleasure. All right. And that's it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and send us feedback at podcast at schlaw.com. And if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating. We are also featuring the original music of Chris Thompson. And finally, we want to thank our fabulous producer, Jackie Santos, for making us sound so good. Until next time, I'm Katie Wilson-Milney. And I'm Steve Schindler, bringing you the Art Law Podcast a podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The information provided in this podcast is not intended to be a source of legal advice. You should not consider the information provided to be an invitation for an attorney-client relationship, should not rely on the information as legal advice for any purpose, and should always seek the legal advice of competent counsel in the relevant jurisdiction.